morning. We'll look at verses 1 through 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Be the third book in the New Testament. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, uh, there's one right in front of you in a pew. Feel free to crack that open. If you have your phone, you can always Google Luke 2. It'll pop right up. We do that all the time. So Luke 2, 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his spouse wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. No room to be found for Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. I mean, seriously, you would think somebody would let a nine-month pregnant woman into their home somewhere. Somebody would open up their house for them, right? Heard the story of several years ago, the, the church held a Christmas play. And they had you know, everybody all dressed up there, and they were all the characters from the nativity scene. And they had a four-year-old play the innkeeper. And he had worked on his lines, and they had everybody, had, and so sure enough, here comes little, you know, five, six-year-old Mary and Joseph, and they come walking up, and, and they come, the little four-year-old innkeeper, he comes up, and Joseph asks, do you have any room for us? And no, replied the innkeeper, the inn is full. And Joseph replied, but it's so cold outside, and my wife is going to have a baby. Do you have any room for us? And the little boy, he paused for a moment, and he started thinking, and he forgot his lines, and he says, I don't know what I'm supposed to say, but you know what, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> but our passage here this morning, it says that Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Did anyone ever read the passage of scripture about the innkeeper? No. It's not there. That's completely filled in. In fact, a lot of our Christmas story that we're familiar with has been filled in from songs and from movies and from plays and things like that. A lot of times as people, when there's something that we don't understand in the Word of God, we try to fill it in with our own words. I've never seen that work out well for anyone. <laughs> now there's no heresy in somebody talking about it in Keeper, but it has led to a lot of misunderstandings. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about the Christmas story. Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. That's close to the winter solstice. And... The organized church basically just replaced the pagan tradition and a holiday with Christmas. Jesus was probably born somewhere around late in September, maybe early October. There's nothing about Mary riding a donkey into Bethlehem. She may or she may not have. She may have walked it. We, aren't, we don't know. Again, it's not specified in Scripture how she got there. Jesus wasn't born in a red barn. It was more than likely a cave that was dug out underneath the house. There's great speculation that they feel that they have found this place. In fact, that was where Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate. He thought that he wanted to be where Jesus was born, so he did all the work right there. And the three kings. The Bible doesn't say there were kings, and it doesn't say there were three of them. There were three gifts, but we don't know how many of these wise men there actually were. And they didn't show up when Jesus was born. It was probably two years later until they arrived. But yet all of these things are there. We all talk about it. Most scholars agree that Bethlehem was too small to have a Holiday Inn Express. So there was, no, there was more than likely no inn even there. But all of these people were coming together. 
What's beautiful about the book of Luke is the way Luke writes, and he includes so much detail. For anyone who's ever looking to prove the authenticity of the scriptures, this passage of scripture is very valuable because it is all it can all be cross-referenced to history. You see, this was a beautiful time for the world in some respects. Because it, it follows, we all know the story of, geez, uh, let me say right? <laughs> we all know the story of Julius Caesar. How he was betrayed by, by a good friend, how he was stabbed in the back, how he, he died. But what we don't understand is after that there was a, a little fight, there was a war between Octavia and Mark Anthony, and they... And they jostled around, and Mark Anthony he got involved with Cleopatra in Egypt, and then things got ugly. But eventually, Octavia won. And there was one of the first in several centuries a unified Roman Empire. Octavia changed his name to Caesar Augustus. And as Caesar Augustus, he was in charge. And he wanted to find out exactly what he was in charge of. So he called for the huge census to be taken. And all of this is documented in history to hit right about what we now call 1 to 5 AD. So this is exactly why everybody is going to Bethlehem, or the house in which, or the town in which they were from. Now Joseph and Mary, actually, were both of the line of David, so they had to return to Bethlehem to be registered so they could pay their taxes. So they... So they come there along with many other people, and they're all trying to find a place to stay because this isn't, you know, there's no super highway, there's no cars, and it took them quite a while to drive, even if it wasn't that far. So they show up, and they're looking for a place to stay. Problem was, they may have got there a little bit late. She's nine months pregnant. She's not moving real fast, right? And they get there, they get there late, and there's everything's full. Nobody will let them. And maybe I'm giving folks too much credit. Maybe nobody wanted to let them. What didn't they like about this situation? To be blunt, they were embarrassed by their ages. She was pregnant, and they weren't married. And a lot of the gossip had been going around for a long time. Who's the father? Joseph? Did they hurry things along and sleep together before they were married? Was Mary sleeping around? And Joseph just being a good guy and covering for her? You can imagine. And everybody knows how quickly gossip can spread. And they were, I'm sure, had a lot to say. In fact, why was Mary even there? She didn't have to come. Joseph was the one who had to show up. She probably didn't want to stay at home. It was so miserable for her there that she would rather walk to Bethlehem nine months pregnant than stay home in, in Nazareth and listen to all the gossip and the backbite. And away they come. And nobody will let them stay. Nobody wants anything to do with them. Now, I like to think that if that were me, and that was my situation, and I saw a couple like that, I'd let them in, and I'd let them sleep on my couch or something like that. And I'm thinking that, and then the other day I'm driving home, and I'm on Route 51 coming, going south toward Elizabeth and the Elizabeth Bridge. Well, I know that, that uh, the right lane's closed. And there's signs up a mile away. So before I even get to the uh, top of the hill, I make sure I'm in the left lane. And uh, I get down almost to the verge point. Here comes somebody who's been flying up. I've been waiting in that left lane for a while, right? But they come flying up, and they expect me to just let them right in. Well, to be honest, they're obeying the law. That's exactly how you're supposed to do it. Okay? But I put my time in in line in that left lane. Mm. I don't want to let them in mm. because that's going to cause me great personal heartache having to actually wait for 10 seconds while they cut in front of me. <laughs> and you laugh because you've been there too, right? <laughs> I got mine. I'm there first. 
lot of it had to do with that. Hey, we got our room tough. It's already crowded in here. Tough. I don't want you in it. I certainly don't want some sinful woman who's carrying an illegitimate child in her room in my house. Because I'm perfect. I've never done anything wrong in my life. But that's where they stood. They needed a place to stay. You know, John 1 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. Maybe I'm reading into it too deeply. Maybe it had nothing to do with the illegitimate birth. Maybe it had nothing to do with that. Maybe they just had too many other things to worry about. They were busy. They had other things on their mind. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus. They didn't want anything to do with all of this. I know it was in October when I went to Sam's Club. I'm looking around and Christmas decorations were everywhere. <laughs> it wasn't even Halloween yet. And they're all over the place. And I'm looking and I'm seeing all of these different things. And I'm seeing Santas, I'm seeing slaves, I'm seeing elves, I'm seeing inflatable bridges, I'm seeing you know, all this all the pretty stuff. It's beautiful. But I wasn't seeing nativity sets. I wasn't seeing mangers and baby Jesus. I wasn't seeing angels. I wasn't seeing shepherds and wise men. Why was that? You know, so my first thought is, well, you know, this is wrong. Or I should be offended by this. And I started thinking, well, you know what? I've got a nativity set at home. It lights up. At least I thought it did. We tried to plug in and Joseph went to light up for a couple days. But <laughs> we fixed that the other day. Now Joseph lights up too. But I ain't going right? That is John, that's right. <laughs> Too many times we have expectations of this world that they are going to think like Christians. Mm. Why should we expect unsaved people to act like saved people? Right. I think it's because sometimes Christians have no problem at all acting like non-Christians. Right. So why would we have it in our minds that uh, Jesus said it clearly. He came to do his own. His own received him not. He said that you will face trouble. You will be persecuted. You will be rejected by those who you love. It's going to happen. And blessed are you for my sake. So of course, there's not going to be a huge run on Sam's Club for the Tiffany sets. For the giant glow holes and things like that. That have the the angels and, and all of these things. There is no room for Jesus in most people's lives. So it's not surprising that there was no room for him to stay before he was even born. So why leave Christ out of Christmas? I think maybe somebody figured out that the baby Jesus was dangerous. You see, because when Jesus comes into your life, he will not come into your life as a decoration. He will not come into your life as an accessory. I know, Carrie and Amanda, they did a beautiful job on this. I absolutely love that. And I love the message that it shows. The cradle to the cross. We talked a lot more about that Tuesday night. But that is exactly what the world did not want to hear. Because when Jesus comes into your life, he will not let you stay the way that you are. I know modern day Christianity and people love to throw around that, that little cliche that Jesus will take you just the way you are. It's true. But it's not the end of the story. Amen. You see, so many folks will say, you know, oh sure. You know, recite a recite a little a, a little uh, prayer here. I'll tell you what to say. You say it, bam, you're saved. Move on. It doesn't quite work like that. You see, because when Jesus comes into your life, He changes you. Amen. Amen. He will not be used as fire insurance. He will not be used as a get out of hell free card. When Jesus comes into your life, you are changed. And He starts to ask things of you. When I think of Jesus asking things of me, for some reason I hear Him in my mother's voice. <laughs> 
because I would hear at first when she would ask me. I remember as a little boy, you know, she would say, you know, Danny, please close the door. Hmm. Right. <laughs> Dennis, shut the door, please. Dennis Bruce, close that door, or I put my foot in your But um, and then I would do it. Sometimes it gets to that point, right? Where we hear God calling and we hear him telling us to do things, but we're waiting to hear our middle name. We're waiting to hear, we're waiting to hear the voice raised. We can't just obey. God will not tolerate being ignored. So John 1 11, it does say, he came to his own and his own did not receive. People did not get excited about accepting him then. They're not going to get excited about it right now. But yet followers of Christ have literally turned the world upside down. Do you know how much Christianity has contributed to civilization? If it were not for Christianity, we would not have public health care. We wouldn't have libraries. We wouldn't have public education. We may not have books. We may not have codified language. So much of it is done because, because of Christianity. Harvard University was originally founded as a seminary. Christians have actually changed this world without Christmas decorations catering to them. Imagine that. Mm. So there was no room in the end. Jesus didn't fit in. Nobody wanted to make room for Christ. But also, Jesus' message didn't fit into their thinking. I could try to explain this in different ways, but to me, I think the clearest is this. Mary was pregnant. Her pregnancy had that taint of illegitimacy. We showed up in Bethlehem. Again, she was pregnant. They were only engaged. In fact, you'll hear, you see throughout the Bible, people are referred to, uh, you know, for instance, you know, Peter ben Jonah, son of Jonah. But you never hear of Jesus ben Joseph, do you? It's Jesus of Nazareth. So all his life he carried that title of illegitimacy. Had he been recognized as Joseph's son, he would have been called Jesus, Jesus ben Joseph. The only reason somebody was referred to by the town in which they were born was if their father was unknown or if they were claimed by their father. And nobody ever let this go. In John 8, 41, we read his enemies, and they said, we are not illegitimate children, implying that he was. That was the Sadducees, the Pharisees speaking to him. Why would God let them say that? Do you think he knew that they would say that? Do you think when God sent this whole thing into motion, and he was bringing about this virgin being with child, do you think that God thought that folks might accuse Jesus of being born illegitimate? Of course he did. See, that was part of the gospel message. So think about this. Who carried Jesus into Bethlehem? Mary, right? She was rejected because people thought they saw sin in her life. They had no room for her because they had no room for sinners. But who did Jesus come to save? Sinners. Sinners were the ones that Jesus used to spread the word that he that was here. I hate to shatter all of these images that we have of Christmas and the Christmas story. But the shepherds to whom the angels appeared, they were not the owners of the sheep. They were hirelings. They were people who were hired. Basically, they were people who couldn't get a job doing anything else. These were the roughest around the edges guys you could possibly ever get. Because they're the only guys who would work for almost nothing and sit up all night long watching sheep that didn't belong to them. Also odd that they were probably the sacrificial lambs that they were guarding. That was why when the angels came, they had no problem leaving the flocks and going into town. They aren't my sheep, I don't care. <laughs> These were rough guys. Some of them were criminals, some of them were rejects. Nobody liked these shepherds. 
remember when I was, I was young and everybody would always get nervous when the carnival came to town. You guys just ever think, ever go through that? Remember my mom and dad saying, oh, those carnies are here, make sure everything's locked up. I'll be glad when that carnival leaves. That same type of individuals, they were rough. But they were the first ones to get word that Jesus was here. The ragtag rejects, the, he didn't, hey, the angel didn't appear to Caesar, he didn't appear to Herod. He didn't come to the rich, he didn't come to the learned. He came to the shepherds, the working people. The normal, average, paycheck to paycheck folks like you and I. That was who spread the word. So this announcement is made to them, right? And these were the people who he was coming to save. They were the ones that he was looking for. In 1792, there was a young man born named Joseph Moore. He was born in Salzburg, Austria. And he was born illegitimate. His parents were not married. When the, when the father found out that uh, his girlfriend was pregnant, he took off. She had the baby on her own. She was treated for it. And she had a real rough life. And she brought him up, and eventually he became a priest. And as he was struggling, trying to find his way in the priesthood, the one thing that he loved was singing, and he loved the song. So this rejected, illegitimate, sort of rough around the edges priest, he sat down one night and he wrote a song. And he wrote a song and it started out with silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. One of the most popular Christmas songs ever written, translated into over 200 languages. And God used this rejected, illegitimate child named Joseph write a song of praise for the baby who also faced rejection and persecution. So my point is this. God will use anyone who is willing to be used. Amen. He doesn't care what society labels them. He doesn't care where you've been, what you've done, who you know, how much you know, how little you know. God can and He will use you if you're willing to be used. Just open up. So there's a third reason why I think people, why they had no room for Jesus. Hey, babies are cute, right? They're cuddly. They don't do a whole lot. They cry. They have biological functions. <laughs> they need birth, they need change, they need fed, they make noise. And that's about it. They don't really do a whole lot for you unless, you know, it's your kid, but somebody else's baby, you know. I'm going to try to put babies down. They're going to get offended. But, you know, I, I think what a lot of it does, there's not a whole lot of child a baby can do for you. And when it comes to Jesus, I think a lot of people felt that way about him. What can he do for me? He can't do anything for me. Why do I need him? I've met a lot of people in my life. Some very rough around the edges people, and some you know, very dignified and you know, straight laced people. I've met some very nice people who had no room for God in their lives. And as nice as they were, they died and they went to hell. They were nice. They didn't do all these outlandish, crazy, horrible things. But they didn't embrace Jesus. They didn't have room for him. They didn't need him because they didn't think he could do anything for them. So they didn't want him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Folks wouldn't receive him because they didn't need him. They had other ways to get to heaven. A loving God won't send me to hell because I'm so good. My whole family line has been involved in a church for hundreds of years. There's stained glass windows in this church that was named after my great-great-grandfather. God will let me in because of that. 
That's the thinking, and that's the dangerous thinking. I always contend that the hardest person to reach for Christ is the one who doesn't know they're lost. The ones who think that their good works are somehow or another going to leverage the creator of the universe into being forced to let them into heaven. Yeah, God, you created the world. You spoke it into existence. You said, let there be light. There was light. But that's my great-grandfather's name on that stained glass window at that, at that church down on Polish Hill in Pittsburgh. So you have to let me in. There you go. How do you think that's going to work out for them? Just because people don't think Jesus can do something for them does not mean they don't need it. So let's review. There was no room for Jesus in Bethlehem for three reasons, right? One, he didn't fit into people's lives. He was inconvenient. And two, they didn't like the message. He came for the lost, so... He came to save sinners, so if you accepted that message, that means you were admitting you were a sinner. And third, they rejected him because he couldn't do anything for them. But one last thing. There was no room for Jesus in Bethlehem because God planned it that way. God chose to have Jesus born in a manger in an obscure town for a reason. And it's a powerful story that still has reasons today. Remember that four-year-old in the Christmas play? The one who said, sure, come on in. The total unfairness of Mary and Joseph being denied a place to stay just could not fit in a child's mind. It's so powerful that children rebel against it. And every part of that story still speaks to children and adults. A baby born in a lowly manger. And that's just the way God intended it to be. Because had Jesus been born in a royal palace, or even a real nice home, he would not have been approachable as a baby in a lowly manger. A baby being born in a manger was not intimidating, approachable, and accepted. The question that it just hangs so heavy for everybody today, do you have room for Jesus in your life? But dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, and Lord, we think of this 2,000 years ago. Lord, I just ask that you would allow us to search our hearts. And Lord, allow us to see what it is that has caused us to reject you. Granted, Lord, many in this room are Christians and we've given our hearts to you. But Lord, we sometimes put you in a separate little room and we don't make you the we don't make you the center of our existence. Our dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you will always remind us that if anything is to have any value, it must be all about you, including our activities, our attitudes, our motivations. And Lord, we continue to pray for those who have never made room for you in their lives who think they can get to heaven some other way or aren't even concerned or thinking about it. Lord, we pray for those who, who think that hell is just one great big party that they're going to do to live a life of eternal debauchery and enjoy themselves. Lord, we pray for those who have fallen for the lies, for the lies of the enemy. And we pray, dear God, that you would give us an opportunity by what we say and by what we do to show them the truth. In Jesus' name we pray.